is Andy Brandt, and he happened to make a special request, or I am fulfilling a special request. He's got a Coke. He wants four fried chickens, but I just got him a plate full of four fried chickens. So, at your leisure, my friend. Thank and you. We want to introduce him. Andy was so close, does great things. Love, love working with this guy, and we want to welcome him to thank Congress. Give him a round. Thank you. Um, so this is the uh, this is my fifth year uh, attending Saint Con um, and fifth time speaking. So I'm I'm really happy to be back. Um, for those of you who are sitting like way in the back there, there's little tiny stuff that I'm going to be showing that's up here on the table, and it might be hard for you to see. So I, I you know realize that some of you have already gotten comfortable, but if you can come up closer, if you really want to see that stuff, that would be great. Um, so I'm Andrew Brandt. I'm, the, I'm a principal researcher at Sophos, and I'm the editor of the Sophos Labs Uncut blog. And um, in between working on running a lab in which I detonate malware uh, for, uh, for you know, modern, normal malware on real machines, um, I volunteer at a place of, that has old computers, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that I do with that group. But before I jump into that, I wanted to mention that this is a, wow, sorry. Uh, this is an interactive, um, this is an interactive session. So I, I welcome and encourage you all to just interrupt me if you have questions in the middle. Um, if you do ask a good question, uh, I have presents. So I have um, music CDs, I have stickers from the Mal, and for the very best questions, I have actual 1980s viruses on floppy disk that you can take home with you. So um, I am also not an expert in any of this stuff. I want to just caveat the entire talk uh, in that I am uh, virtually, uh, you know, I am essentially just a ringleader here, uh, not the lion tamer, not the like expert on all of this stuff. And that this is, you know, purely just ways that I figured out how to do some of this stuff. It is not necessarily the best way or the only way to do it. Right, so a little bit of history. Um, this week, actually, this coming week, is going to be the 50th anniversary of the first message ever being sent over the, what was before the internet, it was called the ARPANET. And it was sent from, uh, it was sent from UCLA, and I believe it was to the University of Utah. And the, so that's a picture of some of the guys in the lab at UCLA, because they're celebrating this, uh, this milestone next week. Um, and the first message was, just those two letters, L-O, and does anyone know why? Has anyone heard this story before, and do you know why the first message was L-O? Okay. It was because they were trying to type login, and it crashed after two bytes. So you could say that the internet started with a denial of service attack, and you know, it, it only went downhill from there. Um, 34 years ago, uh, computers were becoming fashionable accessories, and you even had people like Andy Warhol and Debbie Harry from Blondie uh, being pulled out of you know, the dustbin and trying to use to be you know, promoting computers as creative tools for artists. Um, and this was, uh, I, I created this slide because I gave a talk about this stuff a couple weeks ago at Virus Bulletin. It was being held at a conference uh, center at the Hammersmith uh, Novotel Hotel is the same hotel where this computer was introduced. Now, this was a terrible, uh, you know, it was a star-studded event, and they spent a ton of money on it, uh, but the computer was very poorly received. It was considered to be exorbitantly expensive, nearly $1,500, and it didn't sell well, and Commodore didn't last much longer. So I mentioned I've been doing some volunteer work, and this is the, the place where I do the volunteer work. Um, there is a, a, a lab at the University of Colorado Boulder called the Media Archaeology Lab, and it's, a, um, it's actually set up by a literature professor who was doing her graduate thesis on, um, or her PhD thesis, on electronically mediated um, uh, entertainment and storytelling. And she discovered that as she was collecting more and more examples of this stuff, that she had to maintain an increasingly large number of functional computers and other devices in order to read the media that the, that the games, the poems, the stories were written on. Uh, and, and that became uh, this media archaeology lab. But the craft or the, the um, study of media archaeology is actually a serious academic pursuit. 
Um, and it does require necessarily not only maintaining the software, but the hardware to play it. So the lab is where we do that. And this is a, just a picture of the front room in the lab. And you can see it's basically arranged in a kind of a rectangle. And it's, uh, the computers are in the room roughly oldest to newest in a certain chronological order. And on one side is all uh, X, uh, or I guess it's um, PowerPC, Macs. And on the other side is the other older and newer computers as well. Um, but we also have uh, a lot of entertainment technology, so record players and eight-track players and you know, even a giant Edison gramophone that has no power, but when you play a record on it, it just absolutely is like the loudest thing you ever heard, and it's kind of hard to imagine that this thing that's made of brass and wood could make something that's that loud, but it works great, and everything is maintained in working order, so people can just come in and use them. For the purposes of this project, um, I used essentially three different platforms because I'm looking at three different pieces of malware uh, that predate uh, Windows by quite a lot and in some cases predated DOS. Um, and maybe not um, all DOS, but MS-DOS. Um, although Microsoft was writing the DOS and some of the basic interpreters for some of these really old computers. In fact, if you look at you know, even the TRS-80 Model 3, which came out in, I want to say, 79 or, or 80, um, that it, uh, it was one of these computers that used Microsoft Basic as its uh, main thing. Right, so these three machines, the Apple II, the Commodore 64, and the VAX. So it was really hard to bring a VAX machine here. I don't actually have one. Uh, what I discovered is that it was much easier to kind of create a simulated uh, VAX machine uh, in this little box that I've got here on the table, which is called a PyDP11. Um, but th these are basically the three platforms that I used. And as I mentioned, these, most of this malware predates MS-DOS and Windows. The platforms that they're on are obsolete. Most of it won't work on anything that you have in your house. So why do we need to study this stuff, right? These are the three pieces of malware that I'm going to be talking about today. The uh, Elk Cloner, uh, BHP Virus, and the Morris Worm. Um, I'll tell you why this is really important. Every, as, and as I was doing this work, I had no idea what to expect and how, you know, I was learning as I was going what these things do. And what I discovered is that in studying all of these old, you know, ancient viruses, I mean, the, the elk cloner is, is over 35 years old, um, they exhibit many of the same behavioral characteristics and use some of the same techniques and tricks that modern malware do. They are, they are essentially the missing link in the malware chain. And it, it is, the more you look at it, the more you realize how much of new, new stuff is basically based on this ancient stuff. So let's start. I'll talk about the Elk Cloner first. Um, it was one of the earliest malware. I say one of the earliest. A lot of people call it the earliest malware. The problem is, is that um, there's probably stuff that we don't know about that never got released or that wasn't as virulent. But it's definitely one of the oldest, if not the oldest. Um, the way that it worked is that when you ran it, um, it would be on a disk with some games. And the games would be infected and trigger Elk Cloner to load. Um, Elk Cloner would load itself into memory, and then the way that it worked with most people who had Apple II computers is you would have like a DOS, it's called um, DOS 3.3 boot disk. You would pop that in, boot the computer, pop that out, put in your game, play it, pop that out, put in a different game, do whatever you needed to do. So that basically the operating system kind of was memory resident uh, and, and not dependent on the disk being in the machine all the time. So the malware was also memory resident, and it would write itself into the boot sector of the floppy so that every 50th time that you started up the computer, it would play a message. And, um, and the message is here. You can see it in the source code. And I'll just read it because it's just such a fun little poem. It says, Elk Cloner, the program with a personality. It will get on all your disks. It will infiltrate your chips. Yes, it's cloner. It will stick to you like glue. It will modify RAM too. Send in the cloner. So the guy who wrote this is actually still around. His name is Richard Screnta, and the source is on his website. So it was really easy to find. 
Um, but like most of the people who I spoke to about the malware that I studied in this, um, in this uh, discussion, um, the, the creators didn't really want to talk about it, and they, they kind of distanced themselves from it. Now, Skrenta doesn't, he's not ashamed of it, um, but he hasn't been particularly forthcoming and basically just wants to put it behind him, and that, that was sort of my experience with everyone else that I spoke to as well um, about all the malware. But so the trick is, to get this thing to work, um, we had Apple II computers, which was easy because we have a whole set of different ones. Um, we have a, it's a hardware and software combination uh, gizmo called ADT Pro. So ADT Pro is the software, and there, and there is a client that runs in Java on modern uh, Windows or Mac PCs. Um, and there is also a network adapter that's plugged into the back of the device. And so what ADT Pro does is it allows you to have a modern computer and move files back and forth from a modern computer onto the Apple II and even write to floppy or you know, load things from the modern computer directly onto the machine as though it were the floppy. Um, we also used a couple of different Apple II compilers uh, and a copying program called Copy2 Plus. Um, so I mentioned that the, the site uh, where Scrant has got his stuff, is, it's right there. Uh, it's all the source code, it's not the object code. And the, uh, like a lot of early malware, it's written in assembler. So it's not a basic program, it is, it is something that is much harder to get a hold of and uh, to get it into uh, an, essentially an ex executable format. Um, it's really a pain in the butt, so how did we do it? Um, we had to use ADT Pro to move it onto um, the, um, from, you know, downloaded on a regular machine, moved it onto a floppy, um, copied the compiler program onto another floppy, used a dual floppy drive, Apple II, to basically boot off of one, compile on the other, and then try to, you know, grab that compiled code back off of those floppies using ADT Pro so we had a copy on a modern machine so we could do things like upload it to VirusTotal. And I just wanted to point out, so the, this, per, this particular machine came out in 1982. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the malware came out in 1982. Um, TCP IP as a protocol was finalized and became official on January 1st, 1983. So it was, it predated uh, the internet, but the, this cool little thing about ADT Pro is the software lets you um, connect it to the network. So this is the only time that you can actually see uh, TCP I set up a window on an Apple II. I just, I think that's cool. Um, so we ran into a lot of problems with compiling uh, the, uh, the Elk cloner. So it doesn't run on certain newer systems. We have Apple II, we have an, we have an original Apple II, a later version of Apple II, Apple IIc, Apple IIe, and it kind of crashed out on the emulators and it didn't really like the newer computers like the IIe and the IIc. Um, we used two different compilers. So at first, we were using a compiler called Merlin, and Merlin was throwing all kinds of errors. It, was, it looked like it was compiling, but then when we tried to execute it, it would kind of fail, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. And then finally, Skrenta replied to a, a DM that I sent him on Twitter, and we had a little bit of a, an email exchange, and he told me to use this other compiler called Big Mac, which I've downloaded, but we have not yet compiled it with Big Mac. Um, we also did, you can also take uh, source code like this that's in assembler, and you can paste it directly into uh, memory areas and, and then just execute it. Uh, that area um, where you can do that is called the monitor, and you basically go into monitor mode and you can insert the, um, the assembler directly into memory and then hit G and it should run. But we didn't have any luck with most of those things. Um, Actually, my experience of working with Apple II systems is that I hate ProDOS, which was their operating system, and I never want to have to do it if I can help it ever again. And I don't know whether I'm Mothra or Godzilla in this picture, but this is my experience of working with Apple IIs and trying to get stuff on and off of them. The, benef the, the good news is, is that on the original Apple II, we were able to compile a version of the, of the 1.0 Elk cloner, and we did get it to execute one time, and then it corrupted the disk that it was on, and it would never run again, and we could never repeat it. So we're still working towards getting a you know, properly replicable uh, sample of the Elk cloner that we can then uh, put up on VirusTotal, but at least you know, for now, you can see like, what it does is it just basically says Elk cloner 1.0 is now resonant and flashes. Um, the 2.0 is the one that's, that 
displays the poem. Um, I was talking to some folks at, as I mentioned, I, I gave this talk at uh, Virus Bulletin a couple weeks ago, and one of the longtime people who had been uh, pretty active in Virus, at Virus Bulletin, uh, this guy named uh, Vesely Bonchev, um, it, who's a pretty well-known guy, he does, he's uh, Vess on security on Twitter, um, he told me, hey, by the way, I have a whole annotated source code like record of everything uh, from Elk Cloner, and by the way, like, there's all these function calls that no one's ever sort of disclosed before and that were never been, you know, nobody's ever like tried to use as far as I know. And he sent me his annotated source code. So this is, you know, there's two pages here and it, it has things like, um, you know, there's error messages, there's ability to ring, you know, uh, sound making devices that are on the computer. There's also uh, calls that can, you know, reset the counter that goes to 50 before it runs. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. And so once we get this thing running, I'm very interested to sort of fuzz the Elk Cloner and see what are all these other functions that it can do and see if we can trigger all of them. So Elk Cloner. Um, BHP was an interesting one, and it, it was a challenge for a completely different reason um, that had nothing to do with my inability to use the computer. So I, I have, um, I was a Commodore 64 owner as a, as a kid. Um, and I have a lot of experience with using it, and one of the volunteer gigs that I have at the, at the MAL is that uh, I teach people how to use the Commodore, and we have a, a bunch of different software that, we, that you can uh, load on it, and uh, for a variety of different reasons, different educators come and do residencies, and that's what we, we do, is we teach them, and sometimes they teach us on uh, how to use some of these machines. Um, the BHP is, is interesting because the hardware for the Commodore is um, unique. Um, it is a, it also a memory resonant virus that writes itself into the boot sector of floppy disks, um, but it has some really interesting pioneering features. When you think about the fact that this was like 1986 when this stuff was happening, uh, this was a basically the malware equivalent of cavemen carving a car out of stones with whatever they could find on the ground. And they, so they had all these anti-analysis and anti-debugging features that prevented you from sort of uh, tapping into the memory address space where it was loaded. Um, they, it obfuscated itself because it was all in assembler, and there weren't even any nice strings that you could use like there was in the Elk Cloner to see the poem. Um, and, um, and the coolest thing about it is, so the Commodore hardware, um, especially its 1541 uh, floppy disk drive, is, a re is really a unique piece of hardware in that it's not just a floppy drive, but it actually contains a bunch of RAM and a bunch of processing power, so it actually can offload a lot of the tasks that would normally have been done by the computer. And the reason that, that Commodore designed it that way is that they assumed, uh, probably rightly so in the t at the time, that um, they wanted to be able to just uh, shunt as much data into the, the floppy drive and let it do most of the heavy lifting of reading and writing off the disks so that the computer would be free to do other stuff. Um, and it was, it was an interesting um, experiment, but what the BHP authors uh, decided to do was that they took advantage of the fact that there was that memory that was in a separate peripheral but connected to the machine, and they loaded themselves into the floppy drive memory so that even if you wanted to power cycle the computer to get rid of the, uh, the virus, you could not get rid of it unless you power cycled the floppy drive as well. So it was pretty devious and sneaky. Um, so to reproduce BHP um, was actually much easier. Uh, I, again, I have a lot of experience with the Commodore. We have all the devices there. Um, I used this tool, which is called a Zoom Floppy. Uh, Zoom Floppy is essentially an interface between uh, the Commodore floppy disk and a uh, USB port on a modern computer. And using some software, I was able to um, read and write floppies uh, pretty easily with, with this thing, and I um, have been you know, continuing to do that. The malware itself is available through a uh, Commodore software archive. Um, the main one that I've been using for most of the project that I've you know, been doing here is this thing called the Commodore 64 Scene Database, or csdb.dk, um, and that's the, uh, the URL where you can find it. Um, so it's, you can get basically the program there. Um, you then have to use some tools to uh, turn it into a, a, a disk image and then write that disk image to a floppy. So uh, the way that it works is um, you use this tool called Durmaster. It basically takes that, uh, that 
program, the Commodore 64 program that you downloaded, and it basically writes it to, it creates on the fly a virtual floppy disk. The virtual floppy disks are uh, usually 171K in size. Um, the, the malware is about like 2K uh, in size. And um, so you write this to, with Duramaster, create the disk, and then use um, the other tools uh, with this uh, CBM for Win. So CBM, Commodore Business Machines, was, was uh, their um, protocol that they use. And there's CBM for Win, and then there's GUI for CBM for Win, um, because I hate using command line stuff. So I like to drag and drop things. And so I use this old uh, GUI that someone had written, and you write out uh, the program onto the thing. And when it runs, it is supposed to look like this. Um, what I found is that there's a couple of interesting caveats with that. Um, so it does have a better chance of running on physical hardware than on an emulator, although you can get it to trigger on an emulator, which I'm going to try to do in a minute. Um, the Commodore has a clock built in, but it doesn't have a battery. So basically the clock starts at zero as soon as you turn the machine on and it just starts counting up from there. Uh, if the seconds on the clock end in two or four when you launch the malware, it will trigger. So it's a, basically it's a roll of the dice. It's about a one in five chance in, in any t given time you're going to trigger it to, to infect. Um, and technically it's not destructive, but it does overwrite parts of the disk. And occasionally, you know, if you've got a lot of stuff on a floppy, it might just, you know, uh, trim off the end of the directory, which means you lose the ability to run your program. So uh, with that, I'm going to... Uh, bring up the um, Commodore uh, emulator. It's called Vice. Um, and I've already loaded the directory for this floppy, virtual floppy disk that I've got here. Um, it's on uh, drive 8. And so this file is called BHP virus. So the way that you load programs on the Commodore is you just type load, quote, the program name, quote, comma, 8. Um, now the way that it works is the malware loads, most of the content of the malware is in memory. But there is a basic component, basically a hook in basic, that allows you to trigger it. And when you execute that hook in basic, it goes into memory, uh, reads the, you know, the instructions in the command set in memory, and then that part of that command set rewrites the basic code uh, that, is, that is in memory for the, where the user has access to it and changes it. And it, only after that has happened does the malware uh, trigger itself or will it trigger itself. So I'll show you. Uh, this, is the, um, this is the basic code of the malware uh, that just all it does is say, go to this um, obfuscated memory address, obfuscated if you can't do math, uh, and then run this thing called virus. So we hit run. And we get this error that says fatal error in you computer. Yeah, it's, uh, it's suspicious, right? And when we look, when we list that program, all of a sudden we realize that it's changed that one line of code to this print statement. Um, so this means that the malware is now resident, but it has not actually triggered. The way that you trigger it is to try to uh, load the directory off of the disk a second time. And this is the part that's tricky. So. If it doesn't work, I apologize in advance. You saw the picture. It does pretty rainbow stuff. Um, right, so it didn't trigger. But the good news about the Commodore is that you can just move the cursor back up to the command line and just do it again. And again. And again. And at some point, it should, if I'm lucky, it will trigger. Remember, it's a roll of the dice. And it did it. There it goes. All right. And it, so that's the entirety of the virus, right? It says, uh, Dr. Strobe, Dr. Dr. Strobe and Papa Hacker was here, co-programmer Garfield. Hallo, Dickershen. Dice is ein Ector virus. Um, I don't speak German, but like there's a bunch of people at VB who did. And they basically said, this says, hello, fatty. This is a real virus. And that's it. And at this point now, that floppy will be infected, and it will have like placed that bit of code into uh, ROM on the uh, or on, into RAM on the floppy disk. And then, if I were to take that floppy disk out and swap it with another one, uh, it would infect that. There is actually also, uh, by the way, a um, a 
malware remover that basically goes through and scrapes uh, the floppy drive looking for uh, pieces of the code. So even though they used obfuscation in the code, uh, they had chosen, they, they gave it this instruction set that allowed it to pick a different random memory address every time it was loaded, and then they failed to actually use that instruction. They just jumped over it. So it always loads in the same place. So most of the um, BHP cleaners basically just go to that address, look to see if there's something there, and wipe it out. So, so that's it, BHP. Right, the Morris worm. All right, everybody's talking about this one because it's kind of a big deal. Um, every, I'm sure everyone in this room knows about the Morris worm, um, but if you don't, or if you're not all that familiar with the story, I have a little video that I wanted to play to kind of bring you up to speed. And hopefully it will actually play. Doesn't look like it's doing it. Hang on. All right. Can we turn the sound up? Life in the modern world has a new anxiety these days. Just as we've become totally dependent on our computers, they're being stalked by saboteurs. Saboteurs who create computer viruses. The Defense Department, universities, and research centers are still recovering tonight from a computer virus that brought a nationwide network to a standstill. One of the institution's hardest hit was MIT. David Boweri reports. It was first spotted at NASA Ames and ran. It came from California, maybe. Traveled by electronic mail. It spread across America. How insidious was this virus? Well, it was, it spread very quickly. There are reports in newspapers today that it has made its way to Europe and to Australia. It arrived at MIT in the middle of the night. The students were safe. Their computers weren't. Just ran. It would enter your machine. It would do its thing. It would go to other machines. At MIT, 200 computers were infected. Across the country, the toll might be 6,000. It could have been worse. We believe it was intended to spread more slowly than it did so that it wouldn't be noticed as quickly, which would actually have been more insidious if it spread out to a large number of machines and, say, held a surprise and did something. Mark Eichen, student and part-time virus hunter. Once we had it stopped, we were able to take it apart, sort of like dissect it and tear it apart piece by piece. But these three processes right here, these three programs, the SH with the friends around them, are, the, are in fact copies of the virus that are running there. It's not really a virus, it's a code, a set of instructions, an act of sabotage that started on a floppy disk. This virus spreads by disk and by telephone. It's just a call away. And like a virus, it replicates like crazy. Look at this, and look at this, and look at this. And as it replicates the code, the so-called virus eats up large amounts of memory. It wipes out stored data or cripples the hardware. This virus clogged a system linking thousands of computers, but apparently did no damage. It's benign. It's not malicious. It attempts to do no damage besides propagate itself. Uh, and that's why I think it's a warning. The suspect? Somewhere. A dark genius. I suspect it's an A student. A good A student. So lost computer time, but no files destroyed. Just a thrill for the virus hunters and a warning. My personal speculation is that this is somebody who is trying to, to, to warn people to say, it can happen to you. Mr. President, we have not even been able to isolate the cause. The virus, if it is a virus, it's like the common cold. It is everywhere, it is nowhere. For the 10 o'clock like news, I'm David Boweri. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of themes in this v news story that, uh, you know, s feel very modern, like um, someone was trying to teach someone a lesson about vulnerability uh, without causing damage, but trying to make a point. Um, at the time that that news story ran, uh, nobody knew that it w had originated in the lab of uh, Robert Tappan Morris, a junior, uh, who was a student um, believe at Cornell, if not MIT, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it happened uh, almost 31 years ago to the week, and uh, it, 
it actually spread using a number of different uh, methods. So it had, there was an exploit against the finger daemon, uh, there was an exploit against send mail, and there was a brute force attempt against uh, a bunch of different accounts on the machine. Um, one of the things that was uh, crucial is that it was only uh, able to target machines that were running uh, BSD 4.2 or 4.3 on the VAX 11 or Sun uh, workstations. The Sun workstations were able to uh, get infected, but they couldn't spread the, the malware. So really the VAX was the only platform uh, that spread the malware further uh, after it got infected. Um, it, was, it took advantage of an interesting uh, feature in that version of BSD where um, if you had an account on a machine and that machine was trusted by another machine, uh, you could log in without a password just using a username on that second machine so that there's basically this like transfer of trust from machine A to machine B with, uh, without using a password. And so the brute force attempt was actually just a bunch of usernames, not even passwords. Uh, but it were, you know, some of the usernames were people that were obviously well known uh, in the computer industry at the time. Um, it, w it had an ability to throttle itself. So it was only supposed to spread uh, one out of every seven attempts at trying to connect to a, re a remote machine. Uh, but what Robert Morris didn't realize is that that was nowhere near uh, a restrictive enough a, a limit uh, to kind of keep it from going haywire and it went completely ballistic and it, like they said it, it kind of spread like wildfire across what would have been the ARPANET um, or the early internet in those days. Um, it also had a, a hard-coded IP address uh, which is still exists in the source code today and it points to a machine at uh, UC Berkeley uh, which is of course uh, offline at this time uh, and it disguises itself as a copy of shell but it's this shell with parentheses around it so uh, take note of that because that's actually relevant. Um, so soon after the uh, soon after the worm was was released, and it took uh, two or three days of uh, a lot of putting people uh, putting a lot of heads together to do incident response and figure out a method. and And the the incident response methods were uh, to either rename send mail on on the infected machine so they couldn't be reinfected, or to patch send mail uh, to get rid of the vulnerability that allowed it to. Uh, be, be leveraged to send out more copies of the worm. Uh, the technical report uh, here, it was written by the professor Eugene Spafford, and it's actually a, it's a great report, it, and I think it's probably uh, the first example of a like proper academically written uh, malware analysis paper. Um, and it, it is a really interesting uh, paper because it does discuss how um, there was issues with the incident responders and the people who were at the, the sort of the heads of the uh, this group of people that were uh, tasked with dealing with the worm uh, decided collectively that they would never release the worm code to the public because it was too dangerous and someone might mimic what had been done and you know relaunch it against other machines and everyone knows what happens when you keep things obscure it obviously keeps them secure forever. So um, to reproduce the Morris worm is, has actually been the biggest challenge so far. So I am not a I'm not really a Linux user, uh, not a Linux guy, uh, not a BSD expert on, in any sense of the word, and certainly not an expert in workstations. So uh, you need to have either the VAX or the Sun, you need to have um, uh, the BSD set up on it, which was a very tedious process involving something like 20 different floppy disks and loading them onto a, uh, I think it was a five megabyte hard drive that the thing used. So in order to do this properly and to be able to do the kind of testing and repeating that I needed to do, um, I used an emulator called SimH, which emulates all these really old uh, workstations and mainframes. Um, there are at least two different versions of the source code that I found. The m by far the most prevalent one that you can find on the web is this annotated version uh, that's, that's on this um, uh, Arialdo Martini's website on, on GitHub. Uh, but then I found just recently an unannotated version uh, in this other person's uh, sort of GitLab folder, and they called it Tapeworm. But it was essentially they had they had reproduced Morse Worm, but they had removed all the annotations and comments out of it. All those annotations and comments, as far as we know, um, that they were they were added afterwards by people who had done um, sort of post hoc analysis on the worm. And they had done, you know, decompiling and reverse engineering to create the source code. So uh, even though I have to, 
you know, sort of functional copies of the source code. As far as I know, they're not real because they have all these comments and edits and notes about how the worm works and what it does. Um, and I've had no luck in uh, asking people like Gene Spafford and that guy Mark Eichen, who was in the video who I contacted, and a bunch of other people all basically said, oh, well, it's out there floating around on the internet somewhere. No, it isn't. So as far as I can tell, I showed you at the beginning of this section, there was a screen that showed um, a floppy disk from the Computer History Museum in San Jose. If that floppy disk actually has the Morse worm on it and it wasn't just copied from one of these GitHub repositories, that may actually be the source uh, that I need. And I'll be reaching out to them soon to try to get a copy. Um, but I needed hardware to build it, right? And I wanted to do something fun. Uh, and, and honestly, like, St. Con, this is your fault. Uh, because last year, after building my badge and then building about 100 mini badges, um, I became kind of obsessed with doing soldering projects. And I signed up for a, a subscription service called Hacker Boxes. And I started you know, buying kits left and right. And now I'm just it, sort of incorrigible. And this was kind of like my graduation present into sort of the world of like big scale uh, soldering. So this kit is called a PyDP11. Um, and even though it is uh, just a uh, two-third scale uh, housing, it is actually a functional device. But I'll show you some screenshots of like it comes as a PCB with all these parts. You have to solder in all these uh, LEDs. And at the end, with, it comes with this nice housing and the, and the front plate and the switches. In the end, you get this nice thing that boots up and it, and it can run a variety of different operating systems. And what's cool about it, and some of the, some of the cool things about it, um, is that it has, uh, it comes built in with uh, 14 different operating systems available to you. So uh, again, I'm gonna take a, a quick minute here and do a demo uh, using the PyDP. So uh, let me bring up PyDP. Right. So on the PyDP, there is currently two machines running. Um, there's the sort of core operating system, and there's the version of the operating system that's running, um, that's running the version of BSD with the worm on it, and that and you know is basically ready to be used. Um, to control the the uh, PyDP, there's all, like I said, there's all these switches here in the front, and there's these operating systems that are listed on this screen down here in the uh, bottom left corner or bottom right corner. And uh, for example, if I wanted to boot this thing into uh, BSD 2.11 it says that the switch settings are 0102. And all of these, so from this white switch this way, uh, these are uh, groups of three switches or octal switches. So if I wanted to um, start up number one, 0102, this would be the first zero with all the switches down. This is the first one, zero. And then two, it would be not this one, but this one. And then you pop this little button in and it should, if it's still connected, hopefully reboot. But I'm not sure that it's connected. Ah, it's not connected. These things happen. All right. So it is now uh, starting to boot um, BSD 2.1. And what, what's great about this thing is it's not just pretty lights. It actually does have the ability to uh, be used in its sort of normal way. Um, each of these switches uh, is used to control memory address space. So you can load your program into a specific memory address, flip the switch on when you want to run it, and there's a button here that says start. And it's literally like using um, you know, a, de a debugger. So you hit start, you can run your program. If you decide at some point you want to pause it, there's a, there's a halt button here, and then you can step through it with a mechanical switch. And so it, it is actually kind of a, a cool thing uh, to be able to do experimenting with this stuff. And there's this dial actually sets it to use uh, memory space that's used by the kernel, or memory space that's user space, or program space. Um, so it is actually kind of a fun tool. And when you, when you boot into uh, BSD, it starts in single user mode, which means it's in root. Control D takes you into uh, multi-user mode, and then you can log in as a you know with a proper user account. It's more like uh, the old BSD, uh, the way that it would have been. Um, but so, in addition to uh, all of those operating systems, so there was not a version of the vulnerable uh, Morse worm uh, operating system on this device. Um, but I met a guy who is 
Uh, by day, he's a patent attorney in Los Angeles, and by night, he is a, um, he's a PDP expert and, and BSD guy. And uh, I was really grateful to meet him because he built me this version of Unix that's basically vulnerable to the worm. So let me log in. So when you log in, it always automatically jumps the uh, it jumps the uh, the the PyDP um, version of the operating system to the main window. So the second window is actually uh, the root of Raspbian, the operating system on the Pi. Um, so there's a directory in here called 43BSD, and oh, I think it was running already. Yes, it is. All right, I need to kill it, and then we can start it again. Oh, I stand corrected. It's not running. Okay, good. So the command is sudo start the vax boot.ini. And it knows, with the boot.ini, it knows to use the, um, the disk drive for the uh, BSD build that's running on here. I'm sorry, I had this running a minute ago and it kind of pooped out, so we have to give it a second to load. Um, but while it's doing that, and it does a little disk check at the beginning, we can talk a little bit about the um, preparing it. So um, it does have, uh, it has to be configured to use Ethernet. Um, Ethernet was part of the, the makeup of those things in those days, there was no Wi-Fi. Um, but there is a Wi-Fi file that you can use, so you can emulate Ethernet uh, with Wi-Fi if you want to. Um, one of the things that I am trying to do with the Morse Worm is to use, uh, I want to use wired Ethernet because I'm trying to capture PCAP of the worm traffic. Um, when I spoke to Mark Eichen, he suggested that uh, analysts at the time, they had captured traffic with TCP dump, but there's no PCAP of actual Morse Worm traffic, so that's one of the things I'd like to create. Um, and then building the worm itself, uh, once you get the worm source code in there, and it, you, it's very easy to just FTP it into the uh, directory that you want, um, but there's a lot of things you have to configure. So among, among other things, uh, there was a, an, a, an error in the source code for worm.c, which is one of the files that controls how the worm spreads, uh, and it, it had an include that uh, pointed at a path that was incorrect. So you just lose the, slash, the sys slash at the beginning of that path, and it compiles. Uh, the other piece that was missing in the source code that you can download, but that we added here, uh, are these five defines that, def that sort of designate um, what ports it's going to use for certain behaviors, right? So uh, we know that it, it was uh, using send mail to, to spread, uh, and the SD SMTP server had to be defined here. Uh, it used finger D to spread, and so the finger port is defined here. I'm not 100% sure what exec server and telnet were used for by the worm author, but the command server 23357 TCP, that port was used by the command and control server that was at Berkeley. Um, it doesn't function anymore, and the, the code that would talk to that part, that uh, machine on the internet, all it does is send one packet to it, and it doesn't listen for a response. So it's kind of a pointless command and control uh, set up, but, but it, does, it does need to be configured there in order for it to work. All right, so let's see if... All right, that's the other one. All right. All right, so we are logged in, and my source is in user local source. And there are three directories in here. I've got the, um, the annotated, the unannotated, and a leet version of the malware in here. So we'll go to just the Morris worm directory. And inside of the directory, there's these, these 10 files. Right? So building this is pretty simple. 
Um, you do have to have the, obviously, you have to have it on the machine that you're going to uh, run it on to compile it, but uh, just make to, to run the, uh, the make file that's there in, the root in that directory. Um, that builds most of the worm. And what you get after you do make is an executable called test, um, and just an elf. And boom, so it's done. All right, and there's our directory, and you can see sort of two-thirds of the way down on the bottom there, it says test with a star, and a star next to it. That's our executable. But there is another component of the worm, which is the actual worming component, the piece that, that tries to spread using um, uh, SendMail and Fingerd. And that's the file at the very bottom that's labeled uh, x8113550.c. And that doesn't get compiled when you do this, so you have to do a cc uh, of that file. Now, I made a duplicate uh, of that file. I made a copy of it into a file called l1c, which is not part of the original. Uh, it was not part of the archive that I downloaded. But in the Stafford, uh, the Spafford paper, uh, he writes about the fact that there was basically this worm component that was compiled separately, and re it's referred to internally as l1c. Um, that was because the payload would uh, dynamically change its name. So to, to uh, boot this, you just do L C C L one dot C, and that builds a second program that is called A dot out, which is now on the top there. So there's now two two new files in addition to those dot O files uh, for all of the dot C files. There is a uh, A dot out and test. Um, this is where it gets tricky because there's no instructions anywhere on how to run the malware. So uh, it took a lot of poking through the source code and trial and error to try to figure it out. And for the most part, I was not successful. However, this morning, and, oh yeah, uh, I had a little bit of an epiphany as I was preparing for the talk, and I tried something different. Um, so as I mentioned, this a dot out is the, is the part that you run and that is the worm uh, binary, that's the executable, it requires three arguments. And the arguments have to be in this order. After you write you know, the program name, the IP address that you're going to target as its first target, what it's going to try to connect to, a port number, which in the case of the worm can be you know, 79 if you want to do finger D, uh, or 25 if it's SMTP, and then a magic number. And I was thinking about it, and I couldn't figure out, like, you know, we were, myself and this other guy, the patent attorney, we were trying to figure out, how to, what's the magic number? Like, how do you even do this? And, and finally, it came to me this morning as I was working on this. Damn it, they're magic numbers. They're right there. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Then I looked, and I'm like, okay, well, I'll give that a try. So um, let me show you what happens. So uh, the command is uh, a dot out. Uh, we'll just give it an IP on the same subnet that I'm on, port 79. And then the magic number, uh, one of them, is OX0014-8898. Um, interesting thing about this. Tomorrow I'm giving a talk about a ransomware called Megacortex. We, we discovered, the company I work for discovered it in May. It hit a bunch of our customers, we did a bunch of postmortem on it, and it got a lot of press. It also requires, essentially, a password to be uh, input into the command line. Otherwise, you can't launch the malware. Um, and it just strikes me as really familiar to see this command line where you have to have this, like, ma this magic number that's hard-coded into the binary that it won't run unless it has that. And like, it's the same damn thing. So I'm going to run this. I'm sorry that the text is so small. I'll make the screen as big as I can, but we run it. It doesn't say anything, but if you PS AUX, at the very bottom you can see here, there's that A dot, A dot out in parentheses, which is exactly what you saw in that screenshot from the guy in 1988 when he was pointing at the screen and saying, this is the copy of the worm. What, one of the behaviors that it does is that it will rename itself SH, uh, but it does it with the parentheses, and you, it, it's essentially trying to make itself, I mean, it's essentially the same as a modern Windows malware renaming itself explorer.exe, but with a 1 instead of an L. And so it's just trying to like hide in the process list so that it makes it harder for people to notice where it is. But it was so noisy and created so much of a mess 
that it couldn't help, people couldn't help but notice that it was this one process that was basically consuming all the CPU cycles on the VAX and causing everybody's like jobs to crash and making everybody mad for about three or four days. But um, yeah, that's, that's it. I mean, it, it, it feels um, a little bit uh, anticlimactic to say like, we've just run the Morris worm for the first time in 34 years, but we just ran the Morris worm for the first time in 34 years in this room. And I'm pretty proud of that, so. Very nice, right? So we're still trying to get that source code. I mentioned I'm going to be reaching out to um, uh, the Computer History Museum. Uh, but if, if some of you know uh, this person, Hexadecimate, on Twitter, uh, she is a researcher who works for another company, but she also uh, was on a side project, was trying to see if she could FOIA source code from the FBI. So she filed this FOIA request with the FBI and just yesterday got her response that said that um, in response to her request for the Morris Worm source code that the FBI uh, is unable to identify records responsive to her request. So, there, so the FBI does not have a copy of the Morris Worm, at least in the way that Emily uh, submitted her request, but we'll we'll keep trying to find the original source code. Once once I have something that I feel confident is the real deal, I will um, I am going to uh, upload it to Virustool, and we'll have a uh, an IOC list of like the world's oldest malware for everyone to share. Um, and that's pretty much the talk. So I wanted to thank all these people who helped me do this stuff. So Oscar Vermeulen and Chase Coviello. Oscar makes this thing, uh, does it as like a a project of love out of his home. It's not even his day job. Chase Coviello is the uh, um, patent attorney who uh, built me the BSD. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues at the Media Archaeology Lab, Laurie Emerson, who's our director, and uh, Libby and Chris, who uh, give me a lot of support and help me with some of this stuff. And then all these other people who basically helped me hunt for source code along the way um, were all very helpful in this regard. So thank you and thank them. Uh, because now we have the Morris worm, and we can actually say it's not just apocryphal anymore. So nobody interrupted with a question, but we have a few minutes, right? I think we have a few minutes for questions, so yeah. Wow, okay. So if you've got ransomware on your computer, uh, on your mother-in-law's computer, what's the first thing you should do? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to speak to the relationship you have with your mother-in-law. I'm sure that it's, you know, warm and, uh, you know, uh, welcoming. Uh, I, I think it depends. So usually by the time the ransomware makes itself known, it has already done all its damage. Um, and uh, the, the only recourse at that point is to restore from a backup unless you feel like paying a criminal money, uh, which I don't recommend. But it turns out that for businesses, the FBI and some insurance companies actually do recommend it because it can be less expensive than the cost of remediation. I just find that to be an offensive proposition. Yeah, so, there, so there's, a, there's a group called No More Ransom, and uh, there's also ID Ransomware, and they, what they do is you can upload the ransom note there, and they, they kind of hash it, and they will tell you what type of ransomware it is, and if they know that there's some kind of a decoder for it, uh, they can point you to it. But um, yeah, most likely uh, you're kind of screwed. And hopefully you just have good backups. Yes? So um, the question is, were there any legal or other repercussions to any of the virus authors? Um, so Robert Morris, Jr. Uh, was a professor at MIT, and um, he has he he had some uh, law enforcement uh, issues when the worm came out. Uh, he was convicted of a computer crime. I don't know. I can't recall whether he served any time in prison, but he is uh, notoriously sensitive about the topic. And to I was speaking to there was someone who was at the conference here yesterday who said that uh, she had Robert Morris as a professor in university. And he said on the first day of class, you are not to ask me about the worm or you will fail. So he's pretty sensitive about it. And I, I can understand that having, you know, having had to have gone through all of that, he must be uh, very troubled. But um, Richard Scranta, 
uh, is a successful software developer and it's not part of his daily life and he doesn't love to talk about it or anything, but he's got it up on his website and he can, you can go there and download the files. Uh, and we don't know who the authors of the BHP virus were other than their handles, but you know, ho hopefully co-programmer Garfield is somewhere you know, enjoying a lasagna. Yeah. Uh, any other? Yeah. Oh, so the, okay. The question is, do we know any of the motives of these things? So, um, with the Morris worm, we do know the motive because he had gone through a whole court trial. And uh, Morris's motive uh, for releasing the worm was that he had identified this vulnerability in SendMail and had tried to convince uh, uh, Berkeley Software to uh, update SendMail, and they refused to acknowledge the fact that this vulnerability was serious. So he he literally like you know, released it to the world as a worm to sort of prove a point that this is, that this is a dangerous bug. Um, and then, you know, ended up uh, breaking computer crime laws for it. Um, the motive of Richard Skrenta is that, so he was a 14-year-old kid when he wrote the Elk Cloner, and he and his buddies, like a lot of kids who used those computers in those days, were swapping, uh, you know, uh, bootleg copies of games. And so he decided to do this, uh, to create this thing, so every 50th boot, uh, his buddies would have to sort of, you know, be annoyed by the fact that this thing, like, popped up, and it was just sort of a nuisance to him. Uh, but it was, it was purely just, like, 14-year-old spite. And, and I think that's basically the case with the, uh, the BHP virus guys as well. It was, it was just showing off uh, to the prove that it could be done, but like, I mean, it was really advanced. The BHP virus in particular is, is kind of mind-blowing when you think about the fact that that was 30 years ago, that people were doing things like doing memory resident malware that was polymorphic and, um, uh, it, you know, and just d you take using all these tricks. You know, they, they pioneered all this stuff in the course of making it. Uh, anyone else? Yes, person in the back. Um, okay, so the question is, how does this help you understand malware today? Really, what I think is important is that it, it tells us all that, this, that these tricks that were pioneered 30, 40 years ago to make these things work are still in use. And that if you understand that sort of like this is the origin of, you know, polymorphism or obfuscation techniques or uh, memory resonant malware or the use of passwords or the use of brute force techniques that, like everything kind of stems from this it's like it's like checking the root of the tree to see like you know to to understand the health of where the branches are going to go and um, for me it was just sort of an interesting exploration because I have this this hardware available and as a media archaeology project um, I don't feel like malware has actually been preserved. I mean, for the most part, all we try to do all day long in, the, in my industry is kill it and get rid of it. And um, this stuff has educational value and it has historic value. And even if it's just something that's displaying a goofy poem, I still think it has some value. So don't know if that really answers the question. All right. Yeah. Oh, there. Is it, why is it called Elk Cloner? Um, well, it didn't, wasn't because of the Elk stack. Uh, I do not know, actually. That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to it. But seeing as I am in contact with Skrenta, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and I will ask him that question. And if he answers me, I'll post it. I don't know. All right. How are we doing on time? I got three minutes. Um, the folks who asked the questions, if you want to come up and choose a prize, that's cool. And if not, then I'll just start taking apart my stuff. But thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah. There, there will be a community talk tomorrow at 1130 where I'm going to just walk through how to get, how to get these emulators, start them up, and where you can, use, uh, you can find disk uh, images. And you can then you know, run your own Commodore 64 stuff on your own machine.